For Jamie Penich, it was always about a new adventure. Where in the world could she travel to next? Somebody would say, Jamie, let's go to Timbuktu. She'd be on the next airplane. Jamie's mom, Patty, says the sleepy town of Derry, Pennsylvania, was too small for her daughter, even at a young age. Jamie had traveled all over Europe and spoke French fluently. What is it that drove her, do you think? I have no idea. She didn't get it from me. <laughs> <laughs> there was nothing here for her. She just wanted to travel the world and see what was out there. In her junior year at the University of Pittsburgh, Jamie, 21 years old, was excited about a new adventure. She would be going to South Korea for a semester as an exchange student. In the spring of 2001, Jamie arrives at Kim Young University in the Korean city of Daegu. The exchange students come from all around the world, but there's another American in the program, 19-year-old Kenzie Snyder from Marshall University in West Virginia. Our little group was really, we were very close. There was Jamie Penich. Yes. What was she like? She was fun, energetic, intelligent, easy to get along with. You two hit it off. Yes. After just two weeks of classes, a group of six students, including Jamie and Kenzie, decide to hop on a train for what's supposed to be a fun weekend trip to the capital city of Seoul. When they arrive here, they go to this tourist information counter where an agent directs them to a place to stay. She told us how to get to Itaewon by subway, and that's where we went. And so the students end up in a cheap motel here in Itaewon, the heart of Seoul's nighttime entertainment. It's located right next to the big U.S. military base here, so there's no shortage of American soldiers looking for a good time. Long past midnight, Jamie, Kenzie, and their friends are on the strip partying. It's St. Patrick's Day, and there's a rowdy crowd out on the streets. The students end up at this bar, where they spend their time hanging out with American GIs. Jamie and Kenzie are the last students to leave the bar. At about 3 in the morning, they walk down these streets back to their motel, a seedy place frequented by GIs and prostitutes. Jamie and Kenzie are staying in separate rooms with other roommates. Kenzie says Jamie decides to take a shower to sober up before going to bed. She gets into room 103 and I follow. She then goes into the bathroom and turns on the water, but she turns on just the hot water. So I step in with her and help adjust the water. Kenzie says she heads down the hall to her own room, but then minutes later, she decides to check on Jamie one more time. I open up the door, I hear the showers running. I think she's okay, and then I go back to my room to sleep. Then, at around 8 o'clock in the morning, Jamie's roommate wakes up and makes a horrifying discovery. There was a pounding on the door. She said, there's a dead body in my room. I can't find Jamie. Where's Jamie? I look into the room, and there's Jamie's body and something. We don't know it's Jamie's body. There's a body on the floor, and there's something covering her head, so we can't tell. The police arrive and find a frightening scene. Jamie had been brutally beaten to death in the bathroom, stopped so hard that her face is unrecognizable. Her body then dragged outside. What goes through your mind? You don't do much for thinking. <laughs> um, how could this happen? Halfway around the world in Derry, Pennsylvania, a phone rings. The lady said, uh, Jamie... Jamie was murdered, you know, it's such a distance and there's nothing you can do, actually. Everything stops. Meanwhile in Seoul, investigators try to piece together some clues. Who could have committed such a horrific crime inside this packed motel? These rooms are so tiny, it's hard to believe how anyone could have slept through such a brutal assault. But Jamie's roommate sleeping just a few feet away told police she never heard a thing. This large, bloody footprint is found on the floor next to Jamie's body. Police speculate it's from a man's boot, and there's more evidence that the killer was a male. A couple staying next door to Jamie in room 102 told investigators they heard arguing, a man's voice saying, you're here now, let's go, and then the sounds of a woman moaning. Then there's the account of this woman, the owner of the motel, who was working the night shift when she says she saw someone leave Jamie's room. As he was coming out, I saw his face. 
He was wearing a jacket and beige pants, and he just passed by me. Those clues, along with the student's account of socializing with soldiers, lead investigators to believe that the killer is an American serviceman. This suspect sketch is released based on the motel owner's account. Agents from the Army's Criminal Investigation Command, or CID, investigate and interrogate the soldiers who were with Jamie the night of the murder. But months go by, and the trail runs cold. To the frustration of Jamie's family, no one has been arrested. I would talk to them, and I would say, did you investigate all these Army guys? And it, it was a difficult thing because, it, yeah, we tested everything. Nothing turns up, nothing turns up. But you were not about to give up. No. No. We knew somebody killed Jamie, and we wanted to know who and why. Jamie's parents write to officials, asking for a new push to get the investigation back on track. But there's another person who just can't seem to let go of the case, Jamie's fellow exchange student, Kenzie Snyder. Kenzie has closely followed the case. She's even emailed and phoned Jamie's family. Kenzie has returned to school in Huntington, West Virginia. She hasn't heard from investigators for months, when out of the blue, she receives a call from an FBI agent. I was surprised that they would be needing to speak with me again. And I was thinking if I can help them find who did this, then that would be really nice. Three investigators meet Kenzie in this motel room in Huntington. Kenzie says at first the agents are friendly, but then one of them suddenly makes a shocking accusation. We know you did it. We know what happened that night. And I looked up and I said, are you saying I killed Jamie? Now they were accusing me. When we come back, Kenzie is about to become the prime suspect. Three people with badges telling me that something else happened that night and they know what happened. It's like I hit her. Was it possible that she murdered Jamie? I know I didn't kill her. And I see my signature on that confession. When we come back. been a year since the brutal murder of Jamie Penich in Seoul, South Korea, and there was still no arrest. Then American investigators met with Kenzie Snyder and began to question what her role in the crime had really been. Was Kenzie the grief-stricken friend who wanted to help solve the crime, or was she the criminal? February 2002. The last person known to have seen Jamie Penich alive, fellow exchange student Kenzie Snyder, finds herself in a motel room in Huntington, West Virginia. She's facing two FBI agents and a CID officer from the U.S. Army's Criminal Investigations Command who'd been involved in the case in Korea. The CID mentioned how much this had affected his life, too, and he wanted to find out who had done this, so they were, you know, really needing my help, is what he said. Kenzie says the agents want to clear up some inconsistencies in her original statement to investigators in Korea. On the second day of questioning, Kenzie says agents start by showing her video and photos of the crime scene. But then, Kenzie says, the lead FBI agent turns on her, and suddenly she's no longer a witness. She's the prime suspect. And then he said, we know you did it. We know, we know what happened that night. And I looked up and I said, are you saying I killed Jamie? But I'm just shocked <laughs> their attitude had changed yes dramatically yes now they were accusing you now they were accusing me kenzie says the agents discourage her from contacting an attorney to prove her innocence she says she agrees to answer more questions kenzie says one of the fbi agents seems intent on proving she and jamie had a lesbian encounter he asked me well who kissed who first I was like, well, we didn't kiss. But I'm thinking, they said that they have evidence. There must be some reason he's asking this. I'm making it, well, I know that I wouldn't kiss her, so, well, maybe she kissed me first. Were you sexually attracted to Jamie at all? No. No. Why were you agreeing to this if, if it didn't happen? Because I was saying, no, it didn't happen. Well, then they're telling me I'm lying. And I have three people with badges telling me that something else happened that night, and they know what happened. They're just getting me to understand what happened. I'm believing them. As incredible as it sounds, Kenzie says she actually found herself trying to help investigators. Isolated and confused, she says she became convinced that the agents knew more about what happened than she did. So she began creating images in her head using information she already knew about the case to follow the FBI agent's lead. 
he's like, well, when did you get angry? I was like, I don't remember getting angry. He's like, there must have been a trigger. There had to have been a trigger that set you off. We need to find that trigger. Sitting in an easy chair, Kinsey says, with her eyes closed and almost in a trance, she sees pictures of herself in that motel bathroom with Jamie trying to unbutton her pants. I was like, what did you do? And I was like, I hit her. Don't know how I got onto stomping, but we'd had me stomping and then me leaving the room. And you admitting that you stumped her? Yes, yes. And I said something like, I, f I lift my foot. Or, yeah, I lift my foot and I bring it down on her face. As Kenzie I has just admitted to the agents that she killed Jamie. Not only that, she signs this written confession. They had gotten me to think that I had killed Jamie. That's hard to believe. It's hard to swallow that anybody would admit to something if they didn't do it. I know I didn't kill her, and I see my signature on that confession. <laughs> I was sobbing in the chair the entire time this is happening because I'm seeing these pictures of me killing Jamie. Those aren't easy pictures to see. Kenzie is released and goes home. 22 days later, she repeats her account to another FBI agent and again signs a written statement. Kenzie is arrested. At first, it was hard to believe that uh, after we put two and two together with her pride and never letting it go, always calling, you know, somebody in the family. But Brian and Patty Penich refused to believe that their daughter was sexually attracted to Kenzie. I believe it was a fantasy on Kenzie's part, and she didn't get what she wished for, so she killed Jamie, so Jamie wouldn't speak up. Jamie would have had no way of defending herself against the size of Kenzie compared to her. In October of 2002, there's a hearing at this federal courthouse in West Virginia to determine whether or not Kenzie should be extradited to South Korea to face charges. Kenzie takes the witness stand, and yet again, she repeats her story of killing Jamie. But now she says she's less certain whether or not she's really guilty. I hadn't convinced myself that I had not done it yet. But I couldn't fully accept the fact that I had either. After the two-day hearing, the judge rules Kenzie Snyder will be going back to South Korea, this time to be tried for murder. December 2002, Kenzie arrives in South Korea, the first U.S. citizen ever extradited to stand trial here. Even at this time, she says, she wonders if those images in her memory of killing her friend Jamie are real or imagined. I'm thinking, did that really happen? Why am I having these thoughts if it didn't happen? Kenzie told us it was only when Korean police brought her back to this motel that she finally realized there's no way she could have killed Jamie. She says the reality of the crime scene did not match the images she had created in her head during her confession. The pictures I had in my head would not fit in this bathroom or in this room. And there wasn't room for us to move the way that I had said I had moved. It erased all the doubt. What is it like being back here? It's hard to be in here and not picture her body. After that visit back to the motel with police, Kenzie recants her confession. But police superintendent Huang Woon Ha, who headed the investigation, remains convinced of her guilt. She confessed to such a level that she would correct police on certain details of the crime. So no, I don't think she confessed to a crime she didn't commit. But in a stunning development, the judge in Kenzie's case throws out her confession, ruling that under Korean law, a confession must be made before a public prosecutor. Kenzie Snyder's trial lasts four and a half months here at Korea's criminal courts building in the capital of Seoul. The verdict anxiously awaited not only by the accused killer, but also by the victim's family thousands of miles away in Pennsylvania. Finally, the judge's decision. Kenzie Snyder is found not guilty. A huge wave of relief <laughs> spreads over me. And I get to go home, maybe. <laughs> but Kenzie isn't free to go home just yet. Prosecutors are so convinced of her guilt, they appeal the verdict, trying again to get her confession admitted as evidence. An appellate court upheld Kenzie's acquittal saying there was evidence that someone else, not Kenzie, committed the crime. The court cited the same evidence that initially led police to suspect an American GI was the killer.
Remember, there was a large bloody footprint found next to Jamie's body, reports of a male voice heard arguing inside Jamie's room, and the account of the motel owner who said she saw a man leaving the scene. The court also cited the lack of any physical evidence tying Kenzie to the crime. Attorney Brendan Carr is helping represent Kenzie. There was blood all over the room, all over Jamie, all over everywhere, not on Kenzie. And that tells us? To me, that's the number one thing that tells me that Kenzie's innocent. If you could talk to Kenzie Snyder, what would you tell her? You have to live the rest of your life with this burden. And if you can do that, you're not a person. What she did, it's unforgivable. And she will never be forgiven. I'm sorry for the pain that any false hope could have caused them. And I hope they find out who did it. And if they think you did? Then I hope they see truth. <laughs> and the truth is? I did not kill their daughter. What really happened on that March night in a cheap motel room in Seoul? Did Kenzie Snyder brutally murder her friend, or was it someone else who remains at large? We may never know who killed Jamie Penich. I'll think about her all the time, every day, till I die. I'll be with her. Looking forward to that day. After yet another appeal, Kenzie Snyder was finally cleared of all charges in 2006. As of 2013, Kenzie says she's married and has a child and is actively working at getting her life back in order. The murder of Jamie Penich remains unsolved. When we come back, three young women living a carefree life in California's Napa Valley until a killer strikes one horrifying Halloween night. This is only an emergency. What are you reporting? Oh, we got attacked. And I just remember saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Stay with us. Now the story of one fateful Halloween night. A killer breaks into the house of three roommates in Napa Valley, but only one survives. There seems to be no motive, no reason, no way to find the killer. But as I first reported in 2005, this story has a twisted ending you won't see coming. For nearly a year, this young woman has been living in a state of terror. It's hard to go to sleep and it's hard to be quiet when everything goes quiet and it's dark. That's when everything comes back every night. This is only emergency. What are you reporting? Oh, oh my God, we got attacked. Let's go to street. Please help. Lauren fears she'll be haunted for the rest of her life. Yeah, it was upstairs. I was downstairs. I don't know what happened. Okay. Both of my roommates were hurt. Oh my God. There have been many nights where I'll wake up or try to go to sleep and it all comes through and I have to just basically out loud say, okay, stop, don't, you know, and push it away. Please come on, Yuri. Pushing away the memory of that awful night. When an intruder slipped into her home, brutally stabbed her two roommates to death, then vanished. I'm downstairs, there's so much they came in, just don't have window. You must get to the point where you're fearful of the dark every night. I hate the dark. I hate the dark. How many people are injured? Two upstairs, I think the barn, I swear to God. So deep is the post-traumatic shock that even now she's unable to let herself cry for fear of a total emotional meltdown. It was the weirdest feeling ever. I was so, I didn't want anyone to touch me. My mom would try to console me a little bit. I'm like, don't touch me. Oh my God, I just, I, I don't know what's going on. I'm going everywhere and my brain is crumbling. I remember my last words on the call was, this doesn't happen in Napa. And I think she said, no, it doesn't or something like that. Nestled in the heart of California's idyllic wine country, Napa is nothing if not a safe place to live. Before that tragic Halloween night, there hadn't been a murder here in more than two years. It seems like the perfect place to raise a family or retire. But not much nightlife, not exactly the kind of place you'd expect to find three single, attractive, career-oriented women in their 20s. What is it like? What's that region like to live in? Napa? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's very boring. I think we were the total single girls in Napa. Still, all three choose Napa as the place to begin their careers, never imagining the horror that lay ahead. 
Lauren, the all-state athlete with a political science degree, coaching volleyball and working at a local college. Adrian and Sonia, the budding civil engineer who works at the Napa Sanitation District. She cared a lot. I learned that kind of slowly, that she really genuinely cared about people um, and her friends and would do anything for her friends, and that's what I really did admire about her. They get along so well, Lauren and Adrian decide to rent this house on the west side of Napa. On the day they move in, Adrian's friend, Ben Katz, pitches in, and a couple of other friends, Lily and Eric, join them for an impromptu celebration. By summer, a bubbly former beauty queen from South Carolina, Leslie Mazzara, moves in. She was, she could literally light up a room. Leslie is a public relations specialist at the high-profile winery of film director Francis Ford Coppola. She could wear me out like no other. It was funny. She... We just more energy and everything? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Or once we went to Santa Cruz all day and laid out on the beach, had a great time. We got back about 10 o'clock. Okay, let's go out to the bar. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm good. That's fine. Through the summer of 2004, Leslie and Adrian, both 26, and 27-year-old Lauren settle comfortably in their new home. Big backyard for my dog, and I planted uh, flowers in the front, and it was pretty spacious, but also pretty intimate as well. On Leslie's birthday, Lauren snaps these pictures of her roommates in the backyard. When I look at those pictures, I see them. I really do. I see their personalities. I see who they are. I'm enjoying the moment of that time we're all together. I was playing sports. I was pretty happy. It was my first time in my life where I was happy with where I was at that moment and I wasn't really too worried about, too concerned about the future. But then on October 28th, the tranquility is broken when Leslie is the first to bring home a boyfriend in the middle of the night. The result? Lauren and Adrian are kept up all night by the lovemaking. And the next day from her desk at the winery, Leslie sends an email apology for the late night rumble. In the flurry of emails that follow, they agree. From now on, overnight male visitors can be expected. Um, I didn't put much thought into it, but I just figured um, in the back of my head that yes, people would be coming over and it was just kind of started the whole ball rolling with that idea. Little did they know that first rendezvous would set the stage just three nights later. When we come back, another late night visitor with far more sinister intentions. He was flying down the stairs, breaking stuff as they came around. And I grabbed the phone and I turned it on and it's dead. When we return. On a Halloween night in 2004, an intruder broke into the Napa Valley home of three young women. Now two of them, Leslie and Adrian, are dead, brutally murdered. Lauren has been spared. Is there a reason or was it luck? And why were Leslie and Adrian killed? It's been nearly a year since the murder of her two roommates, but Lauren can't escape it. Every single day, her mind replays the final hours of their life together. In the worst of coincidences, it's Halloween night, 10.30 p.m., and a TV show all about death, HBO's Six Feet Under, is playing in the living room as Lauren's roommates go upstairs for the night. Uh, I finished up watching that last um, season on the DVD, and then I, uh, then I went to bed. The house is dark for about two hours, until sometime between 1.30 and 2 a.m., when suddenly a security light trips on behind the garage. Chloe, my dog, jumped up and did her bark, and it wasn't a full bark, it was kind of a warning bark. I woke up and saw the light, and then I uh, dismissed it as, oh, you know, Adrian had two cats and they were in and out a lot, so it was just the cats. Lauren quiets her dog and begins drifting back to sleep, but within minutes she hears someone entering the house, going up these stairs. She immediately thinks of Leslie's boyfriend and that noisy night of passion just three days earlier. And I thought, oh no, not again. So much so that I didn't look at my clock. I, had, I didn't want to know how little sleep I had left. I wasn't irritated yet, but I was thinking, you know, please don't keep me up again. Not wanting to be a spoil sport, Lauren stays in her bedroom. Chloe jumped up again and and she barked and she went to my door 
you know, my reaction is basically to quiet her down. So I, Chloe, it's okay. Shh, shh, shh. And um, told her to lie down again. Again, she drifts off to sleep. And then a scream. She screamed unlike anything I'd heard before. I knew it was a blood curdling, terrified scream. It's Adrian. And then just chaos erupted upstairs and banging around. And I knew it was Adrian's scream. Adrian kept screaming and, oh my God, please help, please help. And she was just screaming. And so I jumped up. In total darkness, Lauren opens her door and takes one step out into the hall directly beneath the stairs. But then she's overcome with fear. I was frozen. It wasn't like I was going anywhere, but I was still listening, trying to figure out what was what was happening. But I couldn't really move until he started coming down. The intruder, less than 10 feet away and moving toward her in the dark. It's a scene from so many horror movies. A young woman transfixed for a moment that seems like an hour. And then he started running down the stairs and she's still screaming. But he came down like skipping stairs. I mean, he was flying down the stairs, breaking stuff as he came around. And I just ran out. In her panic, she runs the wrong way toward the back door. I thought, this is a race for me to get to the door before he does. Suddenly, she finds herself trapped in her own backyard. You felt trapped because there was a fence? Yeah. Once I got outside, I just thought, what am I doing? I have nowhere to go, so I just stood there. Lauren hides here behind the house with a six-foot fence ahead of her and no way to scale it. And then she hears it, struggling with the kitchen blinds in the front of the house. Then it was quiet, that's all I remember except for Adrian asking for help. The plaintive cries from upstairs draw Lauren back into the dark house. Not certain where the intruder is, but needing to help her friends, Lauren gropes her way to the kitchen phone. And I grabbed the phone and I turned it on and this is where it was moving, it was dead. I was like, oh my God. It was, you know, that awful beeping sound when, you, when the phone's dead. Holding the dead phone in her hand, she tiptoes up the stairs, terrified that the intruder could be around any corner. I noticed just blood on the walls and everything. A crack of light leads her to a grisly scene here in Adrian's bedroom. I dropped the phone and I just remember saying, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And just, um, it was like a war zone in my house. It was uh, a horror movie. That's what I thought, exactly what I thought when I was up there. But it was not a movie. It was the scene of like walking into a movie. This entire bedroom floor is covered in blood. Lauren finds Leslie here, face down in a pile of clothes, with stab wounds all over her upper body and arms. She may have died while trying to come to her roommate's rescue. I knew she was dead. I just, deep down, I knew she was dead. She finds Adrian here, a few feet away, crouched behind her bed. She's alive, but no longer able to speak and rapidly bleeding to death from multiple stab wounds. The bedroom phone knocked off the hook, explaining why Lauren couldn't get a dial tone downstairs. Perhaps Adrian had already tried to call for help. I knew I couldn't help Adrian. There was just so much blood and uh, she, was, she was far too, I don't know. Amidst it all, Lauren is struck by the unreality of the scene. An enormous amount of blood everywhere and just the, uh, yeah, horror movie. This can't be happening. It's all surreal. It's all slow motion. She goes back downstairs, her bare feet slipping in her roommate's blood. Just got my cell phone, turned it on, called 911 from outside of my room or somewhere around there. Oh my God, we got attacked or something. Who attacked you? Please, I don't know. You don't know who attacked you? Is that your home? The woman was kind of like, I don't understand. I said, you have to, my roommates are dying. Please get somebody here. How many people are injured? Two upstairs. I think they're dying. I just want to die. As she desperately feeds information to 911, Lauren is again struck by that question. Where is the intruder? And then it cut off. Then I realized, you know, I should probably get out of the house. She makes a dash for her car, races away, and reconnects with 911. I'm driving around. I don't want to do this. Guy was, uh, somebody was wait, you're, you're not back in the house? No, I got in my car and left. I don't know what to do. She said, where are you going? And I said, I don't know. I'm just trying to go away. But they instructed me to come back to the house. I didn't want to come back because I didn't know where he was. Uh, what did that person look like when he I don't see anybody, I swear to you. I heard screaming. I heard screaming. And I stayed where I was. 
What she doesn't know as she pulls away is that her memory of crashing kitchen blinds is the last anyone would hear of the intruder who had vanished into the night. Okay, who are the people inside the house? Two females upstairs. And they were both bleeding? Yeah, well, one unconscious, she was down, and then the other one was bleeding and gurgling and not quite, but she was saying, help me, please help me, I don't know what to do. Who do you think did this? I don't know. I really don't know. What it does is it turns my world into looking around and having a suspicion about every. I mean, I was, I was thinking everybody was a suspect. Any of my friends or you know, anything. <laughs> Awful. In the depths of her grief, Lauren is obsessed with some frightening questions. Is the killer someone she knows? Did he intend to kill her too? Not over and over and over in my mind, and I pull up so many details or anything the girls have said or anything, and I don't. But there is something hidden in her subconscious mind. And finally, nine and a half months after the murders, it's about to come back to her. When we come back, new clues begin to emerge. Now we know it's someone who was smoking at the crime scene. And I said, you know, we didn't really associate with a lot of smokers. Did she know the killer? And then I remember that he had been in the house too. When we return. young women murdered in the dead of night for no apparent reason. It seems to make no sense. But as investigators sift through the clues, a different story begins to emerge. Reeling from the double murder in the heart of their community, Napa police methodically scour the crime scene. They collect 266 items of potential evidence, everything from microscopic fibers to cigarette butts. We never know what's going to be important usually at the time where we're there. Over the next several months, lead detective Todd Schulman and his colleagues interview some 1,300 people connected to the victims. Meanwhile, Lauren, the lone survivor, constantly racks her memory for clues. This whole time I've been thinking about different things, and I'd offer up kind of different suggestions to them. It's like a puzzle. We really we pick pieces, we take things from the crime scene that we feel are going to be, that may be useful or may yield evidence. And sometimes we may not realize the significance of what we've collected until much later. They find what they think is the killer's blood, a drop of it, left outside the broken kitchen window. It contains the DNA of a white male of probable North European descent. We've collected uh, over 200 DNA samples from various people we felt we wanted to check against our suspect's DNA. And uh, none of those has resulted in a, in a match. Two weeks after the murders, Adrian's close friend Lily organizes a candlelight vigil. At her side is her boyfriend, Eric. Strangely enough, the murders happened on the weekend they had originally planned to be married. But Eric and Lily had been having their ups and downs, and Lily postponed the wedding. Finally, in January, they announce a new wedding date, acknowledging the loss of their close friend. Life in Napa Valley is getting back to normal. Meanwhile, the investigation inches along through the summer until police take a closer look at the cigarette butts found at the scene. They were able to abstract uh, the DNA from those cigarette butts. And it matches the DNA in the blood found by the kitchen window. It's another piece of the puzzle because now we know it's someone who was smoking at the crime scene. Those cigarette butts smoked right down to the filter indicate the killer may have spent some time lingering here in advance casing that house earlier on Halloween night. He may have even watched as his two victims handed out candy to trick-or-treaters, passing unnoticed in this quiet neighborhood. In mid-August, police tell Lauren that the killer is probably a smoker. So then I, my brain started going, okay. And I said, you know, we didn't really associate with a lot of smokers. But just thinking about it was enough to trigger a forgotten memory. And then it took a couple seconds later, and then I thought, wait, um... Eric smokes. Eric Matthew Koppel, the 26-year-old who had married the friend of victim Adrian and Sonia. And then I remember that he had been in the house, too. Remember, he was there celebrating the night Lauren and Adrian moved into their new home. Eric was, is a um, very, very shy, very quiet guy. Not very social. Not very social at all. He worked at a land surveying firm, but otherwise stayed at home a lot. 
often working in his garage late at night. Lauren recalls his odd behavior in social situations, like the night a group of friends partied at a local bar. I remember asking the question, why is he standing? Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're all here. Well, he's just not comfortable. Lauren immediately tells homicide detectives about Eric Koppel being in the house and being a smoker. And I asked, have you checked his DNA? And they said no. They had um, not checked his, not checked his DNA. Did you ask them to talk to Eric? I believe they said that they would um, check into it. That was in August, and for weeks, Eric Koppel remains on Lauren's mind, his smoking, his odd behavior. A month had gone by since you last suggested this, yeah. and you ask him again. Yeah. And they still hadn't talked to him. They hadn't been able to reach him. Police are focused on the cigarettes, and the next day they release photos of the brand smoked by the killer, Camel Turkish Gold, an uncommon cigarette on the market just four months at the time of the murders. As you can tell in this picture, the, the cigarette filter and the markings on it matches the, uh, the, the butt that we've located at the crime scene. It's a stroke of luck because family and friends, among them John and Lisa Stewart, knew that Eric Koppel smoked Camel Turkish Golds. When you heard that these were the type of cigarettes that the killer had smoked, what was your reaction? I remember my reaction. Um, chills went up my spine. Because the only other time I had ever heard of these cigarettes mentioned was the night we smoked them together. They even have photos of that occasion, a barbecue in Koppel's backyard. I just shuddered. Ooh. And uh, it was an awful sort of moment. Eric Matthew Koppel's name. With his brand of cigarettes now connected to the murders, Koppel goes to family members for advice. And then he turns himself in. Police called you a little before midnight to tell you this, and you broke down. They said something to the effect of, we found him or we have a suspect or something. At approximately 3 a.m. on September 28th, Matthew Eric Coppola was booked into the Napa County Detention Center on two counts of murder. And it took about three seconds for my brain to register what they were saying. And then, um, and then, yeah, I, kind of, I was just shaking and I was very upset. Mr. Coppola is charged with using a knife in each of those killings. When I got off the phone, that's when it really kind of hit me and I lost it. And Lisa, you have no idea either. If he did it, why he would have murdered. Not the guy who planted the plants in his backyard and watered them every day. Now accused of viciously taking two lives. Yeah. And two lives of his wife's friends. Yeah. It just doesn't make any sense at all. When you hear his name, what goes through your mind? Um, it's more when I see his picture now is, is difficult. He looks like such a criminal now. And he was just a shy guy, you know, just a guy that was just seemed nice. He just was, you know, quiet. What could have motivated this shy young man to commit such a heinous crime? There is talk about a fight. His friends look for clues in Koppel's behavior in the hours before the murders, when Eric and Lily attended a Halloween party. There was um, some alcohol, they were having some drinks, and he may have said a couple of things that embarrassed her, and he uh, later even asked her if he had embarrassed her, and she said yes, that he had. I think at that point he even said, you know, um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be uh, drinking um, anything. anything, you know. After the party, they separate. Lily spends the night at her parents' house, leaving Eric alone. Police say he then goes to Adrian, Lauren, and Leslie's house and commits murder. But why would he target his wife's friends? Now remember, Eric and Lily had originally planned to get married that Halloween weekend, but Lily had postponed the wedding. Instead, she was getting ready for a girl's only vacation to Australia with her close friend, Adrian. Could that have been the breaking point for Eric? Sources say prior to his arrest, Eric wrote a suicide note, jealous of Adrian's close friendship with his bride-to-be. If Eric killed your roommates, he knew you lived there too. Why did he spare you? I don't know. 